Hello everyone, it has been a while. This video I would like to share one of the projects I finished recently, EL Term, which stands for Electroluminescence Terminal. I bought these Planner 640x480 Electroluminescence screens a few months back. This player is sort of similar to OLED but it's monochrome. These dot matrix screens typically emit yellow or emberish color, but there are also models with, uh, with um, red and green dual color. Naturally, I would like to make something with this screen, and I decided to make a serial terminal with it, so let's get started. This video contains the following parts. Processor selection, overall design, making hardware, writing the driver for the ER screen, implement the serial terminal, and the final result. First is about processor selection. I would like to implement the whole thing with just a microcontroller. The serial terminal part should be okay, the original VT220 was based on the microcontroller anyway, but refreshing the screen might not. Most of the dot matrix screen technology requires constant refreshing, like at 60Hz. Screen modules that's commonly used with microcontrollers are typically self-refresh screens. The screen module has its own memory and controller, and would refresh from its own memory without microcontroller intervention. For example, like these OLED modules, well, the OLED needs to be constantly refreshed. I could just disconnect the microcontroller and it keeps display. There exist self-refreshing EL screens, but this one I have isn't. It demands to be refreshed at 120Hz, which means the microcontroller needs to continuously push in data to the screen at 120Hz. This puts some requirements on the microcontroller. It will have to either hold the entire frame buffer in the RAM, or it could generate image data at a screen refreshing speed. Both works, but being able to store the frame buffer would be a bit more flexible. Then it should also be able to generate the timing needed by the screen. Obviously, one could do this with an FPGA, and I do have an FPGA video coming up in the future, uh, but that's for another time. For this time, many of the 32-bit microcontrollers work here. I chose the RP2040 from Raspberry Pi. Here are the main specs for the RP2040. Dual-core Cortex-M0, 264KB of SRAM, no internal flash, it executes code from SpyFlash. The most important part for this project is it has the PIO, which is a microcode programmable I.O. module. I will show how to use it to drive the screen. Now let's take a look at the overall design. With the microcontroller in, I just need to fill in the interfaces I needed. The screen doesn't need any extra interface chips and could be connected directly to the microcontroller. The terminal needs keyboard input, so adding a PS2 port here. Of course, I could also just use the USB port of the RP2040 itself. At last, the terminal needs a serial port, so adding a Max3232 for a RS232 port with jumpers for TTL serial operations. For the power supply, the screen has internal high voltage generation, so only a 12 volt is needed. I decided to use 12 volt input for the whole board, then use a 12 volt to 5 volt DCDC to power the Raspberry Pi Pico. Then comes routing the board to keep things simple, I'm using the Pico as a module and mounting it directly on the board. There isn't much special about this board, so I'm not going into details. Once done, exporting, submitting to the manufacturer, and a few days later, I got the board. Then soldering the board. I usually solder the capacitors and resistors first, then chips, and last the connectors. There isn't much stuff on this board, and to be honest, I've been mostly working on more complex boards like FPGA or SOC or DDR and it's kind of refreshing to work with these simple two-layer microcontroller boards again. Now it's time for coding. First about the screen driving. There are clear timing requirements in the screen datasheet. The screen is divided into upper half and lower half, and they are being refreshed simultaneously. Refreshing process is also quite straightforward, just sending the pixels, send a horizontal sync, when reaching the line end, and send a vertical sync on the first line. This sounds similar to a typical RGB or DPI signal, but the difference is it, it transmits multiple pixels on each clock, and there are two raster beams instead of just one. If I directly use GPIO to do that, it would look like this. First fetch the screen buffer address, then enter the loop. The loop only covers half the screen as the screen has been divided vertically. 
each line has 640 pixels divided by 8 pixels per byte equals to 80 bytes. The data bus is 4 bit wide, so each byte takes 2 clocks. The code for sending each byte is simply setting a GPIO based on the bits and sending a pulse on the clock line. Additionally, send the sync signals based on the previous description. It should be obvious that such code is not efficient at all, and here is the result if I run it. It works, but it's quite flickery. If measured with an oscilloscope, the current refresh rate is about 64Hz. It's kind of far away from 120Hz, or in other words, it need to use 188% of the processor to achieve 120Hz refresh rate. Now, I'm to improve that. The obvious thing is to optimize is to not using bit tests to output data, but directly shifting and writing to the GPIO register. Or even better, we have the PIO, which could do the shifting and outputting at a preset clock rate. The PIO needs some microcode for operation. For the first test, the code is simple. The out command is for outputting data signal, and the side is for outputting the clock signal. The code outputs 4-bit data and set the clock high in the first cycle, and set the clock low in the second cycle, then it wraps around. The screen needs two data streams, for the upper and lower part respectively. I'm going to just use two PIO state machines. Put the same signals aside, directly modify the code to use PIO for data output. The GPIO operations are now replaced with code filling the FIFO of PIO, and it waits for the PIO to finish sending the data before sending the synchronization signals. PIO also needs some additional initialization, for example the clock frequency. At 120Hz refresh rate, that's 120Hz by 240 lines by 160 transmissions, equals to 4.6 MHz output clock. The PIO always sends data at a configured clock rate, so the CPU just needs to be fast enough to feed the data without needing additional delay code to match the frame rate. The code is still not complete though. The current code doesn't guarantee that two PIO state machines would always be in sync. For example here, it writes to the upper screen state machine, then it writes to the lower screen. So the upper state machine will start working first. If lucky, both state machine would be in sync. But if unlucky, the upper one would be leading the lower one, causing the image to be shifted. A simple way to solve that is to turn off the state machines, pre-fill some data into the FIFO, then start two state machines in sync. Now run the code. The flicker rate is mostly gone and now we have a steady 120Hz. Though it displays is just fine, the CPU spends all its time just displaying the image with no resources for other stuff, like implementing the actual serial terminal. There are two solutions to this. One is to not solve it at all, just use another CPU core to do other stuff since we have two of them. Another is to use DMA and interrupt, using DMA to send the data to the PIO. And DMA is basically a hardware memory copier, and the CPU just need to tell the DMA where to copy the data. I'm going to use a DMA method. For the code, configuring the DMA to do a memory to peripheral copy, all the subsequent code could be simply using a DMA for copying data. Run the code again, it should still work. It's not done yet as it still eats all the CPU time. This step is just to make sure DMA works. Next step is to split stuff into interrupts. Divide the refresh function into three parts. Function for starting a new frame, function for starting a new line, and a function for DMA handler. The DMA only transfers one line at a time. Once that's done, the DMA interrupt is called again. The synchronization signals are generated in the DMA interrupt. The code then decides to start the next line or start a new frame based on the current position. Finally, add code to enable the interrupt and remove the call to the old refreshing code, done. Now I can add other stuff into the main function without affecting the screen refresh. To measure the CPU load, I can add some GPL toggling and the interrupt service routine. For example, if the I.O. is high, it's in the interrupt, otherwise not. Measuring the signal, the duty cycle is about 48%, which means the CPU load is 48%. Now this measurement doesn't include the interrupt overhead, so the actual load would be a tiny bit higher. With 48%, it's much better than the initial 188%, but that's still not ideal. There is a busy loop in the interrupt to generate a sync signal. There is a busy loop in the interrupt to wait for the PIO to finish. 
DMA only pushed the data to the PIO but not waiting for the PIO to finish. The solution is to let the PIO generate sync signals alongside with putting out the data. Since we have two state machines here, I would assign one for each sync and another for vsync. The overall code looks like this. PIO needs to maintain two counters for X and Y position conveniently using the X and Y register. The X counter needs to be restarted each line, so I'm saving the initial value into the ISR register, and the PIO would reload the value from that. For the first line, both state machines need to output one line of data, and then generate both horizontal and vertical sync. In the subsequent lines, only data and horizontal sync are needed. Looking at the code, both sides load the initial counter value, then the second state machine would wait for the first one to send an interrupt bit. Then both start outputting the data. After the first line, they will output the sync signals. The second state machine goes back to the loop, but the first one continues and goes on to the second loop. Once it has finished the preset number of iterations, it will send an interrupt to the processor and stop. Finally, add in the configuration code enabling PIO interrupt. In the interrupt, it needs to configure the DMA, setting initial values for the PIO, and restart the PIO. Running it now, we can see it. the interrupt is only taking 1.5 microseconds of time, and it's being fired 120 times per second. This translates to a CPU load of only 0.02%, this is a huge improvement. While it's possible to remove this interrupt entirely, precise vertical interrupts are extremely helpful for implementing double buffering or implementing grayscale. With the display sorted out, the next step is implementing the serial terminal. It might sound easy, which is basically you know, displaying whatever received from the serial port, then sending out whatever user typed on the keyboard to the serial port. So let's do it. Prepare a suitable dot matrix font, writing code for displaying the font, building a software FIFO for buffering data received in the serial interrupt, and the fetch in the middle loop. Keyboard wise, RP2040 SDK has built in support for USB keyboards using the tiny USB library. So it's just a matter of translating the key code into ASCII and sending them. Easy enough, right? Unfortunately, no. Obviously issues. There is no arrow keys, function keys, or paging keys in ASCII. How do I send them? Then typically the host needs to send more than just text to the terminal. It also needs to tell the terminal where to put the text, what color the text should have, etc. Most of these are implemented with escape sequences. For example, to move the cursor to position 2-4, one could use a sequence like this to implement. Hosts just need to send this sequence and the terminal should parse and do the corresponding task. There are a lot of these such sequences. I select and implement a few supported by Xterm, which also implement there are tons more I didn't support. Plus, there are even more subtle behavior differences between terminal standards, which could be quite daunting to figure out and implement correctly. For example, imagine the host keeps spitting out text until one line has been filled up. If it keeps printing, then the text would go to the next line by default. But where should the cursor be by the time it has just, just been filled up? What if the application requires to move the cursor at this time? Does it happen before moving to the next line or before? To help with debugging and testing, I end up porting the, the entire firmware onto Linux and Mac OS, so it functions as a terminal emulator. In conclusion, if one is looking to build a usable terminal, I would still suggest looking into existing libraries, such as libtmt or libtsm, but otherwise it could be fun to start from scratch. Now let's run it and see it in action. I'm connecting it directly to the Raspberry Pi, like running pane or running htop. It's a serial terminal, so there is no graphical display. This is about the end of this video. See you next time.